This is a compilation of ABC television news and current affairs items covering the Bougainville crisis from November 1988 to March 1990. The reporter is Sean Dorney. Bougainville Copper Limited has chewed 1,200 feet or 400 metres into the heart of Bougainville Island over the past 20 years, digging this gigantic pit, winning impressive riches for CRA, the majority shareholder, but even more spectacular gains for the minority 20% owner, the Papua New Guinea government. In the mid-1970s, the then Samari government rewrote the Bougainville Copper Agreement, introducing a world first, a resources rent tax in the form of a super tax on windfall profits. Bougainville Copper Limited has provided the PNG government with no less than 15% of its total internally generated revenue since independence and the country's economy with a massive 44% of its total export earnings. The share that goes to the local landowners is set by law. They get compensation payments and 5% of the royalties. The other 95% goes to the North Solomons provincial government, the best financed in the country. But disputes within the landowning groups over where some of the money has gone, frustration with what's happened to their land and what they see as their ill treatment has led to the dumping of the old leadership of the Panguna Landowners Association and their replacement by a younger, more radical executive. When the mine was started, most of my people were ignorant. I was a small, small girl when the company came and I have grown with the company and I know what's good and what's bad. The new executive is demanding 10 billion keener compensation, $14,000 million dollars from CRA. To press their demands, they've embarked on a coordinated sabotage and arson campaign. In the space of half an hour one night, raiding parties set fire to six installations, spread several kilometres apart around the Panguna town and mine site. They stole explosives and blew up a power pylon, bringing mine production to an abrupt halt. The company is clearly worried by what it sees as a breakdown in law and order. Well, we're very concerned about the, uh, the current situation and in particular, of course, our concerns are for the safety of the employees and their families and uh, that's paramount, of course. And uh, secondly, we're concerned about the uh, protecting the company's assets. One of the issues of greatest concern to the landowners is waste. The Jabba River has suffered the most and the people claim their fish are being poisoned. All the scientific tests, including one done most recently by a visiting independent New Zealand team, have shown that this river is not chemically polluted. The natural state of our land has been exploited and all our resources have been gone forever. And the people think this land will never be restored to its natural state. That's why my people are demanding 10 billion kina. According to the Catholic priest at Panguna, Father Bob Wiley, the suspicion of the local people dates back to the Australian colonial period and the attitude of the administration, summed up by the then Australian Minister for External Territories, Mr C. E. Barnes. Uh, the Minister for Ex uh, Territories came up, uh, Barnes, and he came to talk with the people and he talked very little, got off the plane and said, you get nothing. So right from the beginning, there's a lot of deception going on, misunderstanding, lack of negotiations from the beginning, and frustration has built to it now like a pressure cooker. It has exploded. So, Did you think it would get this far? I really never thought it would get to the point of destruction. I thought possibly when they talk about shutting down mines, they would roadblocks and so forth. But I think even good people get to a point, as we see around the world, frustration, and we hope no killing will come. That's what we're concerned about now. The villagers do not have much to show for the $25 million that's been paid out to them in compensation and royalties, some of which has gone into a trust now subject to legal dispute. The leader of the Landowners Association believes it's the company's responsibility to build better villages. Before the company of, coming up the company, my people were used to staying in permanent ancestral villages. But now, the company has made my people nomadic. The acts of sabotage have certainly made the national government sit up and take notice. 
The North Solomons provincial premier, Mr Joseph Kabui, who is a Panguna landowner himself, called the landowners to a meeting with the provincial affairs minister, Father Momus, which went on for many hours. The company's exasperation was becoming more and more evident. The Bougainville Copper Agreement is due for renegotiation and the landowners are showing their muscle for a greater share of the spoils. But the chairman of Bougainville Copper Limited and a group executive of CRA, Mr Don Carruthers, has warned the Papua New Guinea government that its international standing as a place to invest is being threatened by what he calls the people's unrealistic expectations. Earlier this year they delivered on us a demand for 10 billion keener compensation plus half of all profits from the mine in the future. Now I regard that as unrealistic. But the Panguna landowners can't be convinced that CRA can't afford a $14 billion payout. I don't believe the company, company has not got that much money it has because it's a large worldwide company and operated with high technology. If it can meet to buy a lot of machinery, why can't it meet the demands of my people? Bougainville was the most reluctant partner in the Papua New Guinea nation. Geographically part of the Solomon Islands chain, it only forsook secession in return for constitutional guarantees of a strong provincial government and a change in name to the North Solomons province. What helped unify Bougainvillians in the 60s and 70s was opposition to the start-up of the copper mine, which had the enthusiastic support of the then Australian colonial administration. Ever since the coming of uh, CRA way back in 1963-64, I can still remember it while I was still a, a young kid at that time. The developmental changes that have taken place have done about a, a lot of damage and on the people. People feel that, that they have been trampled upon. The Catholic Church, which even today provides more health and education services to Bougainville than the government, sides with the landowners. The land is uh, most important. It is equivalent to their life. Uh, so precious that you can say uh, land is really something they live on, live off. So they cannot do without it. Not like in any other country where you live on uh, cash. But cash is something Bougainville Copper Limited has produced in abundance. Bougainville Copper is a fantastically profitable mine. Last year, 1988, total profits amounted to 108 million kina. That's about $150 million Australian. The total disbursements to all levels of government reached a massive $210 million. What upsets a lot of people on Bougainville is that not enough of that money stays here in the North Solomons province. Of the 1988 royalties, the provincial government won 8 million and the landowners less than half a million. The wreckage wrought on the mine in December was in support of demands by a new, younger landowners executive for $14 billion compensation from CRA. But the Bougainville Agreement, which governs the operation and ensures those huge cash benefits to the national government, is supposed to be renegotiated every seven years. But it hasn't been changed since 1974. And according to Paul Nerau, head of the locally owned Bougainville Development Corporation, that's not the fault of CRA. The company has been most willing to uh, look at reviews and uh, honour their commitments. I believe our uh, politicians, our governments, uh, not any particular government, but all governments for, for the last 15 years, both provincial and national government, have failed to really look at this issue uh, as to uh, the uh, proportionate distribution or equitable and meaningful uh, distribution within the province. Leading the landowners is Francis Ona, a former surveyor with the mine who is now hiding somewhere out here in the bush with his group. The police don't even have a photograph. Sent into the province in large numbers in January, the have had a frustrating time of it. You know where to set up your roadblocks for tonight. But while the police have had to guard the mine, the towns and the main roads, they've been under orders not to raid owners' suspected jungle hideouts. 
However, the Premier has just been there into the jungle to meet Ona. Francis is actually uh, very happy with the way things have, uh, have gone about. I have uh, kept him, kept Francis informed of um, the correspondence that I've had with the national government. Um, is he prepared to give himself up? Francis is not a, he's not a criminal. I mean, he's not running away from anybody. Australians have a, have a person like Ned Kelly, you know, who uh, historical records have is a, is, is a notorious criminal, you know, who has vented on uh, um, murdering people, stealing and looting uh, and these sort of things. Francis doesn't belong to that category. But what about the damage that was done to the mine? The damage that was done uh, was, a, was done as a uh, tactic to attract the attention of the world. Up in the mountains above the mine, in Ona's village of Guava, the people pray at mass for Francis, but they're wary now of outsiders, and we were refused permission to film any closer. Their bishop says Ona should go free. I think uh, Francis Ona should be given an amnesty by the government. The government would have to, you know, ignore what he has done. He has done all this, uh, what he has done, uh, as a signal to to, to call government's attention uh, to what, was, what has been happening. The cry of the people for 20 years for better condition for living and, uh, and uh, equitable compensation for the, their land. Bishop Singai is also sternly critical of the police curfew and the Premier, who's a former seminarian himself, has complained about the behaviour of the riot squads, accusing them of harassing ordinary villagers. With two of the major authority figures in the province supporting Ona, the provincial police commander, Luke Pangau, has not had an easy job controlling his men, who feel that they are being held back from, as they see it, cleaning up the problem. But don't you find yourself in a bit of a peculiar position as chairman of the, the Peace and Good Order Committee for the province, uh, with the police wanting to crack down on these people who have broken the law, I think I, I am in a difficult position, but again, at the same time, too, I see my role as a, as a, a person who, who knows the, the underlying uh, motives and the reasons and uh, how far, how, you know, how, how deep the, uh, the whole problem has gone now. The best way to deal with the problem is, uh, I believe, let the uh, police do their home, homework and do their job. And I believe uh, if uh, in the course of doing the job, if they have uh, breached certain rights and constitutional guarantees or protections, well, I believe uh, after that the, uh, the, the law will take its own course. Through all this, Francis Ona has become something of a folk hero, especially to the young. Premier Kabui says Ona has given him a commitment in writing that the landowners are now prepared to negotiate on the $14 billion compensation claim. The Port Moresby government has already announced changes to the mining laws that will quadruple the payout to landowners. Francis Ona regards that as partial victory. When I met up with him um, uh, on Saturday, he, he was uh, very happy and uh, he admitted that um, we have come a long way now. What I wanted to achieve by doing what I have, I am now you know, I'm achieving it and uh, we are getting there. Soldiers from three different companies belonging to both the 1st and 2nd Pacific Islands regiments have been flown into Bougainville. Their numbers doubled since the ambush in the mountains near the Bougainville copper mine last week resulted in the fatal shootings of a lieutenant and a private. The violence began on Bougainville last December when a militant landowners group led by the elusive Francis Ona took to the bush after launching a sabotage campaign against the copper mine in support of demands for $14 billion compensation from Australia's CRA. The trouble ballooned to include an outbreak of ethnic trouble and the destruction of squatter camps. The introduction of riot police and the granting of some concessions to the mine landowners failed to resolve the worsening situation, so in came the troops. 
With well over 200 soldiers already here and more than 350 riot police on the island, this joint police and defence force operation is the largest that Papua New Guinea has ever seen. The military operation against the militant landowners is being planned in detail, but the soldiers have won over much local community support even despite last week's shootings, according to the head of Bougainville's crisis committee, who's a Bougainvillian. Basically, the, the approach that they have taken has uh, built up a lot of confidence among the community leaders and the villagers, uh, despite this incident. The number dead since the troubles began in December is now more than 10, and it seems certain to rise unless the militants surrender. Armed riot police checked all vehicles going into Panguna. Shareholders attending the annual general meeting were told of last year's profit of 108 million kina, $150 million, and how, despite the troubles now afflicting Bougainville, production in the first four months of this year had not faltered. However, the chairman of Bougainville Copper, CRA's group executive, Mr Don Carruthers, told the meeting the board was profoundly grieved by recent events but that the company had consciously resisted the temptation of letting what he called an irresponsible band of malcontents sour his company's attitude towards the mine's future. Naturally very concerned about uh, the events in Bougainville in the last six months, but we believe now that the uh, government uh, will be able to restore peaceful conditions here in time. This year's annual general meeting is being conducted amidst unprecedented security. But next year, if the problems are resolved and if one proposal now before the government gets approved, some of the shareholders in that building could well be landowners. That proposal would have the government giving the landowners a proportion of its 20% state shareholding in Bougainville Copper Limited to be paid for from future dividends. Meanwhile, down on the coast at the port of Kieta, the departure from the province by non-Bougainvillians continues. Most of these people are Highlanders plantation labourers and squatters whose houses were destroyed by Bougainvillian people in the outbreak of ethnic trouble last month. Full military honours were accorded to the two young soldiers, the first Papua New Guinea Defence Force troops to be killed in action since the country attained its independence from Australia 14 years ago. But they were killed by other Papua New Guineans in an internal action has caused much grief. Second Lieutenant Stephen Yandu from Wasera in the East Sepik was only 20. Private Martin Romus from the Oro province was 21. Papua New Guinea's Prime Minister Rabi Namayu called the ambush killings senseless and brutal, but he said the operation to restore law and order in Bougainville using both soldiers and police would continue. The Foreign Minister Michael Samari who saw Papua New Guinea through a serious Bougainville secession crisis in the mid-70s, is a sepik like one of the men he is burying here. But Samari has appealed for unity and called on his people not to avenge the death. This is the heart of one of the world's greatest copper mines. Normally there's non-stop activity 24 hours a day. Now it's idle. The militants have achieved for the moment their objective of shutting down Bougainville Copper. Mining equipment has been attacked. A militant saboteur snuck aboard this giant steam shovel, burning out the engine. This company four-wheel drive vehicle was set ablaze on one of the tracks running into the jungle which surrounds the huge open cut pit. Earlier, sabotage attacks were aimed at the mine's power supply three transmission towers being professionally blown. Those explosives were stolen from the mine magazine. That is now well guarded. But this sort of protection can't be everywhere. And the mine workers went on strike because they felt vulnerable when working on the mine perimeter. The militants have shot dead three soldiers. These riot police are only too conscious they could be next. While we were filming, shots were fired. This huge mine can't be defended against sniper attack from the bush. The militants have found their latest tactic to be dramatically effective. The Namalu government this week stopped short of a state of emergency, 
but its options are narrowing if it wants to keep its most valuable export earner functioning. What has made the people jumpy are attacks on civilians. Eight company workers, three of them women, were injured when these buses were shot up in an ambush on the mine access road. Those shootings followed the gunning down of an Australian consultant to Bougainville Copper Limited, Mr Mike Bell of Melbourne. The militants also blew up two more power pylons. Even when power is restored, fears for the safety of the workforce could keep the mine closed, according to mine manager Mr Bob Cornelius. And this is what the militants appear to want, the permanent closure of the mine. Extra security forces have been moved into Panguna, where 3,000 people live, several hundred of them Australians. Life to now for the Australians at Panguna has been close to idyllic, but that's all changed dramatically with the shooting of Mike Bell and the knowledge that the terrorist tactics have extended to the expatriate community. Amongst those who've had enough are Gary okay, Pringle, a boiler maker formerly of Gladstone, his seven-month pregnant wife and child. We've given up, yeah, we're out, we're, we're heading out. Why? Unsafe. We've, we're an unsafe population here. That they cannot guarantee the situation for the Australian people, let alone the nationals, so it's time to leave. Mr Namaliu came to Australia to reassure big business and his country's principal neighbour that his government was in control of the problems on Bougainville Island. Although three soldiers and at least 12 civilians have died and an Australian man wounded as local landowners campaign against the Bougainville copper mine and the PNG government. The four Iroquois Australia will send to its northern neighbour will be part of the 33 in service here. As well, Australia will train PNG air crew for two years, either in Papua New Guinea or in Australia. But if Rabi Namalu is here to reassure, he's also sympathetic to the rebels. He says while his government will not condone law-breaking, Bougainville Copper's revised mining agreement didn't take account of social and environmental factors in the area. We shall continue to try to limit the activities of lawbreakers and to subject them to the law. But we also understand many of the concerns which underlie some of the more militant actions. Earlier, Mr Namaliu and his wife Margaret received a full ceremonial welcome at Parliament House. It is now the end of May 1989, and with the mine shut down and an increasing atmosphere of danger to civilians, expatriate workers were encouraged by BCL to take leave or resign. Bougainville Copper Limited denies that this is part of an evacuation plan, but there's no denying that's what it's beginning to look like. All but non-essential employees have been told to take leave starting today, and according to a company statement, those non-essential employees and all families will be assisted to return to the place of their recruitment should they so desire. The company says its employees' safety is their first priority and it hopes the early leave program will help alleviate the apprehensions these people have been living with. The reopening of the Bougainville copper mine depends upon the peaceful resolution of the Bougainville crisis. We're six days into a government declared 15 day truce, during which the leader of the Bougainville Revolutionary Army, Francis Ona, has been promised freedom from harassment if he'll talk. He's told the Bishop of Bougainville he will but only if the riot police and the soldiers are withdrawn from Bougainville. This is not the first time a breakthrough in the long drawn out landowners' troubles has seemed promising. For some of the departing Australians, the seven months of trouble has been too much and they won't be coming back. People have had to come down the mountain, no protection, there's gunfire, there's pylons being shot down. Grenade launchers being shot over the top of houses at Panguna and we're just being left for dead. I've got my daughter here, I'm scared for her. We can't go because there are no packing boxes to pack us out and I'm, I just don't know what to do. These families are some of the three and a half thousand staff forced to take their annual leave. The company says they're not needed at the moment. Several hundred Australian employees were given the option of returning to Australia at the company's expense. They're not happy. We've, we've been forced to take our leave. We've been forced, virtually forced into resigning. We've, we've no deal from the company. A company like CRA, a multinational, multi-billion dollar company, and they're offering us nothing. And why they're doing it is to save the costs of declaring people redundant, because if they declare us redundant, then they have to pay us out in full Death with a month's right. package and so on. Well, the last thing we want to do is uh, to make employees redundant. 
uh, obviously uh, there is a cost impact um, for the company. Uh, but, uh, you know, initially and still, the prime motivation of the company is the security of their people. And that's why we're offering the, the uh, company is paying airfares for, for people to go out and come back. And we're also, uh, you know, providing some subsidies in that. One uh, worry must be that you're going to lose some very good staff. Yes, unfortunately, that's true. The situation here is as critical as it can get. People are scared. For those who are working, I had women come down to me to say that they're scared for their husband's safety. There is shots, you know, there's shooting going on. And my husband is up the mine at the moment. My husband had to go up this morning to get his personal effects out. Years and years and years of teaching aids that he's accumulated that are too precious to lose. He had to go up in a private car because he's afraid of being shot up in a company vehicle. And I'm terrified whether he's all right or not. He may not get back. We were shooting up there this morning. That's great. This is Francis Owner's village. The authorities don't know where he is. He's refused to talk since December, but since then, his supporters have done between five and ten million dollars damage to mine property. In a desperate last ditch attempt to solve the crisis, the government has called in the Catholic Church. The influential Bishop Gregory Singkai has been called in to see if he can arrange talks. Francis has uh, written back a uh, note to me and in this note he says uh, he has accepted the truth proposed by the Prime Minister and um, and um, that he would like the Prime Minister to take the security forces away and on his side he would lay down his arms and tell his men not to fight. One of Francis Owner's conditions I think is that he wants the security forces withdrawn from the island altogether how would the company react to that? Well, I just don't see that as being possible. I mean, we've been under law and order problems uh, or under attack from militants uh, since December on many, many occasions. And uh, I just don't think that's an option. Some Australians have already left. Over coming weeks, the 4,000 strong Australian community on Bougainville could be significantly reduced. Families continue to leave Bougainville those that can afford it by jet, those that can't by coastal trader. Thousands have left in the past few months, taking all the possessions they can carry. As some were flying out, Park Winniganese Police Commissioner and the Acting Commander of the Defence Force flew in, sent to Bougainville by the Park Winniganese Prime Minister to restore discipline amongst their men. As the government's casualties have risen, mostly in nighttime raids and ambushes, the security forces have struck back at the local population. These houses at Parkia village were burnt by riot police in a punitive raid following the wounding of two policemen in a nearby ambush on the main road up to the now dormant Bougainville copper mine. Terrorist attacks on the mine workforce shut it down more than five weeks ago and this week the first major retrenchments began. 300 notices have gone out. The road up to the mine has proved to be extremely vulnerable and the soldiers are relying on just one helicopter. Facilities at the mine are nigh impossible to defend. Four soldiers were shot and wounded in a nighttime raid by secessionists on the Panguna water treatment plant. More casualties are inevitable with the state of emergency coming into full effect on Monday. The operation to put down the secessionist rebellion had a fiery start. Houses were set alight in a number of hamlets. For two weeks prior to the operation, riot police conducted punitive raids on villages near the mine access road suspected of harbouring rebels. And although one Papua New Guinea government minister suggested that rebel sympathisers were now putting their own houses to the torch to discredit the security forces, those who lost all their possessions are blaming the riot squads. Orders have been given that the burning is to stop. 50 suspected rebel sympathisers were taken in in the first few hours of the operation, but most were released after questioning. The minister responsible for national security says there'll be more arrests. Uh, we will be uh, paying particular attention to, to priority areas where we think that we uh, might uh, uh, pick up people who are connected with uh, destruction that has gone on in the past uh, seven months. 
Mr Zero says the top priority is to get the Bougainville copper mine back into production. He predicts that the self-styled Bougainville Republican Army will be neutralised in a matter of weeks. He's also been critical of delays in the delivery of Australian Iroquois helicopters, which Parkwinning and his Defence Force wanted on Bougainville by last week. However, Australia received the formal letter of request only three days ago. not new to Bougainville. The soldiers, past and present, marching here in Papua New Guinea's annual Remembrance Day in Kieta, are commemorating those who fell in the war against the Japanese 45 years ago. But the occasion has been put to good propaganda effect by the Bougainville State of Emergency Authorities to remind the population of what the Colonel in charge calls the wastefulness of human lives and resources in times of armed conflict. Up in the mountains, it is day 26 of the state of emergency, but it's not a foreign enemy that these Papua New Guinean soldiers are trying to kill. It's other Papua New Guineans, Bougainvillians who no longer want to be part of the nation, but to secede. They're members of the outlawed Bougainville Republican Army that's already achieved one of its objectives, shutting down the giant Bougainville copper mine. The rebels know their mountains, but even established fortifications overlooking the pit. I took about six hours by Charlie Company of 1st Battalion, initially about 14 days ago, and uh, six hours of battle, and uh, we have secured this ridge. Were there many casualties? Uh, on our side, no. And uh, we believe, as, as reported, uh, uh, the uh, BRA had uh, this spectacularly beautiful but rugged terrain is ideal guerrilla warfare country. The mine itself is all but undefendable. The security operation against the rebels has been relying on a commercial helicopter hired from an Australian company. But the three month half million dollar contract has expired and this helicopter has had to pull out. Papua New Guinea wants to swing XRAAF Iroquois into action on Bougainville although last-minute hitches over conditions, crews and spare parts are causing some exasperation to the men in the field. According to the commander, the Papua New Guinea soldiers are now taking the fight to the rebels, and it's to get the men in and out of these mountainous jungles that the Iroquois are needed. The troops know that whenever they're in trouble, we'll be able to move in there and pull them out or reinforce, uh, so it's, it's very important. Although Australia's CRA encountered opposition from the local landowners when it was opening up the mine 20 years ago, nobody anticipated the campaign of terror and sabotage that has now paralysed operations. When the mine is in full production, these trucks haul out about $2 million a day worth of gold, copper and silver. 40% of Papua New Guinea's national exports. They haven't moved for 10 weeks now and it's not only the trade figures that are suffering. You get some idea of the seriousness of this whole problem for the Papua New Guinea government when you realise that the mine provides 20% of national government revenue. The company says it's bleeding to death. The national budget is hemorrhaging. The riches that over the years have been gouged out of the land and poured into the national government coffers in Port Moresby have only exacerbated the grievances of the landowners whose $30 million share in compensation and royalties has been far from evenly distributed. The current troubles began when a younger, more articulate leadership of the Panguna Landowners Association emerged, led by Perpetua Serrero, whose recent death from pneumonia has made any solution even more complicated. The natural state of our land has been exploited 
and all our resources have been gone forever. And the people think this land will never be restored to its natural state. That's why my people are demanding 10 billion kina. Even the powerful Catholic Church, which holds sway over 80% of Bougainville's people, has been unable to successfully mediate in the crisis. Father Bob Wiley, an American missionary whose work amongst the Panguna people goes back to the 1960s, is Francis Ona's parish priest. We would like to see peace come, and everybody would be happy. Landowners, government, BCL, this is the big thing that we would like to see would happen. His bishop even met Ona in the jungle at the Prime Minister's request six weeks ago. But by then, Ona had linked up with a cultist group, the 50 Toya government, and it's not clear who is in charge or how many rebels are under arms. Knowing these men, but not having seen them and no contact with them, I would think you'd have to say, well, Francis is a good man, and I think he still has control. I think there's a lot of uh, rumours or hearsay. Can you see a resolution? In the, the short term? In any solution like this, is there a short term? Uh, looking at worldwide, I'm sorry to say, but look at Beirut, look at Israel. Everybody wants short term. South Africa, throughout the world, but there are no short term answers. How do you satisfy everybody? This is the question. And the landowners and the people. So I don't know. I just don't know. I wish we, we I think we need more discussion on it, more openness to the whole situation. And, and people really want to say, we want to solve this. The Australian-owned Bougainville Copper Operation is today, more than the Catholic Church or the national government, the dominating influence on the island. The rebels claim CRA has ruined their land and their lives, but the national government desperately needs the company to resume production. Bougainville Copper Limited, the target for everybody's grievances, admits it's made mistakes. I certainly think uh, there's a lot more we can do to improve relationships with landowners. I think uh, our communications with them in the past have probably been uh, not as good as they should be. The authorities have attempted to move people away from the fighting zone into what they've quaintly called care centres. More than 2,600 have been relocated into makeshift care centres, several hundred of them here to the Piruana Community School. Not all are happy about the move. The children have had to abandon not only their homes, but their schools. Jacinta James is a teacher, but in this camp, the priorities of motherhood and caring for her displaced family take over. Young people, they are dying nowadays. And they are thinking yes, that if this thing stops later on, then we won't have any young people to continue on the living that we have in here. What is going to be the end to this problem, do you think? I think to me, my opinion, thing is I usually hear this young, uh, old people talking in here. They really want the, what, the North Solomons to break away from the, the old of the PNG. That's what they really think. The company has already lost 30% of its expatriate workforce, mostly Australians. This is an island engulfed in conflict, but those who haven't left want to hang on to a lifestyle they enjoy. Eventually, they may have no choice. Well, that says it all, I believe. <laughs> I think it has sort of been sort of rumbling there, although you don't sort of say, oh yes, I'm all tensed up and very nervous. It has to be there because you have to be a bit more aware for your family's sake. And you, you know your husband goes up the hill every day and, you know, if you're unlucky, he does has to do work that has to be a little bit more dangerous now. He, he has to go into the country. Then up into the bush, they, they supply armed escorts, but they don't stop bullets, you know, and <laughs> things like this. The military has hit the rebels hard in recent weeks. Five bodies have been recovered, including that of Francis Ona's younger brother Ambrose. The soldiers have also recovered weapons, some of ancient origin. The rebel weaponry may be crude, but it's deadly enough. Prior to the declaration of a full state of emergency, three soldiers died in ambushes. 
The Bougainville State of Emergency presents Papua New Guinea with a crucial test in its 14th year of independence. It's a test not only for the security forces and for an economy with a precariously narrow base, but it's also a test of the unity of a nation composed of a thousand tribes. There's been no surrender yet by the former mine surveyor and militant secessionist advocate Francis Ona. The Papua New Guinea military, who appear to have got the upper hand in recent weeks, thanks in no small part to the Australian donated Iroquois helicopters, have been withdrawn from the jungle yet again to make way for the latest peace initiative. The soldiers are guarding the mine and protecting crucial facilities such as the recently restored power line. The only thing that's been holding back a resumption in production is fear. Fear on the workers' part that they might be attacked by the still disaffected landowner militants, especially at night in this 24-hour operation. And fear on the company's part that any such attack would put the mine permanently into mothballs. The rebels have caused millions of dollars damage in their nine-month sabotage campaign against the copper mine. At the heart of the landowner's grievances are environmental factors such as the destruction of the Java River Valley. The new deal being offered by the Papua New Guinea National Government includes more compensation for the landowners and vastly improved benefits as well as partial ownership of Bougainville Copper Limited. The return to full production will be cautious and tentative. There's a real air of apprehension because of the sudden and destructive attacks by the rebels in the past. The military officer in charge on Bougainville, Colonel Lima de Tona, returned to Port Moresby to argue for a two-month extension of the state of emergency. Back on Bougainville, his men, who had pulled out of the jungle on orders from the government, could not prevent the repeat of earlier terrorist and sabotage attacks along the mine access road. Buses were shot up again yesterday, and another power pylon was felled by an explosion this morning. The company says it will be a week before power can be restored, but any resumption of production after that will depend entirely upon worker safety. Park Winning and his opposition leader says the country's image has been damaged by yesterday's aborted start-up. The government was confident that the mine will open and will open permanently, uh, but the militants have again taken the law into their own hands and uh, they have closed the mine. Prime Minister Nomenu claims the attacks are a last desperate bit by a minority to prevent a settlement between his government and the rest of the landowners. But that minority is proving a formidable foe. In mid-September 1989, killers thought to be members of the BRA gunned down Provincial Minister John Beaker. Students from the assassinated minister's old Catholic high school formed a guard of honour as Mr John Beaker's body was carried on the back of a Bougainville copper truck to the funeral service. The Papua New Guinea security forces can no longer afford to relax. Up above, one of the Australian donated Iroquois kept watch over the procession. The Iroquois have another job now too, ferrying prominent people to and from the out-of-town airport. Following John Beaker's murder, which occurred beside the only road to the airport, at his home, any opponent of secession is a potential target. National government ministers, provincial leaders, even the colonel in charge of the state of emergency operation are leapfrogging the troublesome road to avoid being shot at. John Beaker headed a provincial committee which rejected secession as impractical, and that's why he was killed. Beaker's assassination by the secessionist rebels has not only put off the signing of a new deal for the mine landowners, it has also delayed any restart of work at the copper mine. For the Kieta people, it's meant further grief in an already tragic situation which is defying solution. Several hundred people have heeded a call from the Prime Minister for the people of Bougainville, their churches and leaders, to come up with a solution to the Bougainville crisis. They're calling themselves the Rainbow Volunteers. 
and they've been training here at the Rainbow Rehabilitation Centre for young criminals at the Catholic Mission at Coromira for the past five weeks to be ready to go into the bush to ensure that the rebels keep the peace, but only after the security forces are pulled out. We can't start work uh, with the barrels of the gun, uh, people fighting here and there. We want peace before we can uh, start uh, the operation. The troops have been on Bougainville for more than six months, but the dispute is no closer to resolution. This week, the rebels blew up another power pylon, severing power to the already paralysed Bougainville copper mine. The daylight sabotage, in what is supposed to be the secure corridor between the mine and the mountains and the port, re-emphasised the extreme vulnerability of the mining operation and the ineffectiveness of the current government strategy. The Rainbow Volunteers' suggestion for a pull-out of the troops, peace and negotiations involves considerable risk for the Prime Minister. But the Coromira mission has secured a communications link for Mr Namalew with the rebel leader Francis Ona, and they say Ona has guaranteed peace if the troops and riot police go. The Rainbow Volunteers feel that we have uh, got very good cooperation between Francis Ona and ourselves, and I think you will certainly support us. While this could mean an end to the violence, it would only be the beginning of what would be very tough negotiations involving the landowners, the national government and Australia's CRA for compensation and a possible reopening of the mine sometime next year. Despite the presence of more than 700 soldiers and riot police on Bougainville for the state of emergency, the telecommunications station was not guarded nor is the town's water supply that stands just below. The rebels from the self-styled Bougainville Republican Army, the BRA, were able to gain entry through a fence, and they blew each of the four legs of the tower, rendering it unstable. They gutted the hut containing all the communications equipment. The BRA has stepped up its activities, just as Prime Minister Nomelieu has convinced the CRA board to hold on while he strives for peace. But on the day that CRA met in Melbourne, the militants ambushed and killed three policemen. A little broken glass and some spent cartridges are all that mark the scene of what Prime Minister Numliu has described as a payback killing of great ferocity. This small bridge between the Europa Airport and the Coromira Catholic Mission may well be the spot where Prime Minister Numliu's bold peace initiative plunged off course. In the increasingly tense atmosphere, civilian casualties are mounting too. An Australian-born academic, Graham Aitken, has undergone hours of surgery after being shot through the left shoulder by a soldier who fired at him as they overtook a military vehicle at night. Adoninka lost his wife and four-month-old son, shot dead as they slept in their house at the secluded Pamu village on Bougainville Island. Eyewitnesses say a soldier indiscriminately fired a burst from a submachine gun. One bullet passed through the bamboo wall hitting the 22-year-old mother and child in their bed. Guys whom they suspected were with them on the vehicle and they could have questioned them instead of firing straight into the village. And it was totally unwarranted. The, the shots were totally unwarranted. Papua New Guinea's police commissioner, Paul Toyen, says the shooting is likely to affect adversely the chances of ending the long-running Bougainville dispute. And some locals here don't discount the possibility of yet another payback killing. The incident couldn't have come at a worse time for the Namalu government. In four days, the national parliament will decide whether or not to renew the state of emergency on the island for a further two months. The provincial premier has called for the bloodshed to end and the military to be withdrawn. After 12 months of escalating conflict and apparent government reluctance for stronger military action, the prime minister is now under pressure from the stricken Bougainville mine for an upgraded defence force presence. As the mine provides 40% of Papua New Guinea's annual exports and a fifth of total government revenue, the stronger military option is likely to be adopted. The killings coincide with today's forced retrenchment of 1,000 employees from the Panguna mine, which CRA has shut down indefinitely. About 200 Australians began leaving the island today, where some have lived for up to 20 years. Bougainville, 
a South Pacific paradise on the verge of self-destruction. In 12 months, almost 60 people have died. Among the latest, a defenceless mother and her four-month-old baby asleep in their bamboo hut, victims of a savage guerrilla war which is gathering momentum and new recruits with each passing month. But the fight isn't really between the countrymen of Papua New Guinea and the Bougainvillians. Rather, it's between a small group of Bougainvillians with an affinity for their land and the national government, which they say has not allowed the fair distribution of the benefits arising from Australian mining giant CRA's operations here at Panguna on Bougainville. The militants, led by France's owner, have been so measured in their attacks that they've been able to keep the mine idle since May last year. With the retrenchment of 2,000 workers, Bougainville Copper has been effectively put out of commission and even managing director Bob Cornelius doubts full production will be possible before August and then only if the crisis was to end almost immediately. Realistically, do you ever expect the mine to reopen? Certainly I do. When? Well, when the uh, problem's resolved and when the security situation uh, allows us to, um, to start up again. If it's still dangerous in 12 months, will Bougainville Copper pull out? Uh, you can only answer that in 12 months' time. When you look at this uh, third largest open cut in the world, can you see why the people of the area are upset? Oh, certainly. I can, I can understand. And uh, for, for quite a long time, uh, uh, it's been apparent that um, uh, some better distribution of benefits uh, rising from the mine. Uh, it should have, should have, or some increase to the province should uh, have been taking place. While the dispute has crippled the mine and stung the local economy, the real losers are the people of Papua New Guinea. They rely on Bougainville copper for 40% of the nation's exports and a fifth of the annual national budget. Francis Owner, he's got the national government over a barrel, hasn't he? Um, I don't think he's got them over a barrel, but he's certainly uh, got them in a... Uh, fairly tight corner. The crunch has been felt on Bougainville since the mine shut down about eight months ago as businesses go broke and thousands of people leave the island in search of safety and secure employment. Now the rest of Papua New Guinea is going to have to face the full effect of the mine closure as the government takes the toughest set of economic measures since independence. The government's mini budget includes a cut in public sector spending of about 100 million kina a 10% devaluation of the currency, a credit squeeze and wage restraint. Well, there's no doubt that the PNG economy is in for a very difficult year and uh, will certainly not be out of the woods, uh, possibly well into 1993. For those in Port Moresby, the measures mean hardship. Staples like tinned fish, rice and tinned meat are almost exclusively imported and because of the devaluation, the prices rose last week by 10%. Imports continue to clutter the wharves of Port Moresby. While 50% of the population still live in subsistence societies, the rest rely heavily on goods from other countries. The price of cars, most of which are Japanese and out of the reach of most Papua New Guineans, is also set to increase, again by 10%. The building boom which has hit the capital in recent years will also slow down as credit is channeled into the mining sector and away from business. Prime Minister Rabi Namalyu points out a downturn in the price of commodities like copra, coffee and cocoa has also contributed to the need for the tough economic medicine. Bougainville Copper Limited has been shut now since May. Isn't this an indication that Francis Owner has won? No. Do you concede that there's a possibility that it may never reopen? No. I, 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 I don't uh, concede that at all at this time. The Prime Minister says the time for talking has passed. After 12 months of seeking a peaceful solution, he's had enough. He's now commanded the Joint Defence Force authorities on Bougainville Island to win the war. A war which has claimed more lives than the struggle for independence in New Caledonia. Are you talking about martial law? Not necessarily, uh, but uh, not, not initially anyway. Uh, because uh, we have, as you know, in place now a state of emergency, which gives initial powers uh, for uh, uh, the controller uh, over the uh, uh, situation. Well, what are you suggesting the military should do? Are you suggesting they should go in with all guns blazing? Well, as, as I've said before, if that uh, was uh, the only way to, uh, uh, to, to get to these people, and obviously, uh, you know, their, their actions over the last uh, uh, 12 months 
have demonstrated quite clearly that uh, um, they themselves um, obviously believe that the use of a gun is the only way to achieve their objective. It's not going to be an easy struggle to win. The jungle in Bougainville is thick and the militants know the terrain instinctively. Some are tipping a long and drawn out affair with heavy loss of life. If the last fortnight is any indication, innocent people will again be among the casualties. Seven Air New Guinea flights left Bougainville yesterday, but only a small number of the seats were occupied by Australians. Many expatriates have lived on the island for years, and despite the clear risks posed by the guerrilla war, are loath to leave. Foreigners are being evacuated to coastal towns from the Panguna copper mine, where some of the fiercest fighting has taken place, but it's the PNG nationals who most want to get back to the safety of the mainland. While it was the death this week of a British citizen which caused the present level of alarm, Papua New Guinea mainlanders have suffered some of the highest casualties during the year-long insurgency. And according to some of the few Australians who did return home today, conditions are getting worse. At night time you can hear machine guns going off in town, uh, mortar bombs going off in the jungles, just up in one of the sections, behind one of the sections there. No one knows what's going on because the army doesn't report to the public or to anybody what they're doing. Uh, a lot of people are scared in getting out. The Australian government was today continuing to urge expatriates to get available commercial flights off the island, but at the same time has been stepping up its evacuation contingency plans. The frigate HMAS Sydney steamed out of Sydney Harbour this morning on its way to Townsville, and along with the HMAS Jarvis Bay, it will be awaiting orders to join any rescue operation to Bougainville. Two Hercules aircraft, capable of being mobilised in one hour, are also standing by at Townsville Airport. The Papua New Guinea national flag still flies over the government station at Wapanai, halfway up the northeast coast, but the rule of law appears to have gone. This is rebel country. The airstrip is blocked by the wreckage of the last aircraft which tried to pick up evacuees. It was burned by militants of the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. Sea conditions outside the reef are rough enough to prevent coastal ships coming alongside. At Numa Numa Plantation, Australian manager Mike Allen hangs on although he knows the time is long overdue for him to leave. A Vietnam veteran, he patrols in the bush at night rather than sleep in the house. Plantations on either side of him have been sacked and burned this week, but Allen will not leave until his 500 non bougainvillean labourers have been evacuated. The million cocoa trees he has planted and their record million keen of crops will be left to rot. Allen describes the situation around him as total anarchy. The only way up now is by road, a road whose condition reflects the Bougainvillian grievance that the riches of the BCL mine have not been adequately distributed throughout the province. All along it is the carnage of this vicious civil war. The wreckage of the Kuguria jail, burned by militants, where warders and their families were slaughtered. And the hamlets and trade stores, burned this week, allegedly by warders in retaliation. Amazingly, in the midst of the conflict, 82-year-old Sydney grandmother, Mrs. Evelyn Hamer, is holidaying with her son, a long-time resident. With her is 22-year-old Sydney art student, oh, Kathy Jamison. The stress here, you can just feel it everywhere you go, everywhere is tense. By the first week of March 1990, almost all non-Bougainvillians had left the island. Following a ceasefire agreement with the national government, this included all soldiers, warders, riot squads and even the locally based police force. The BRA came out of the jungle to find itself completely in charge. For Bougainville these days most of the traffic is one way. The empty aircraft I flew in on was packed for the flight back to Port Moresby. Amongst those competing for seats were two of the ceasefire negotiators, an academic Graham Kemmelfield and the North Solomons Deputy Premier Gerald Sonato off for talks with Prime Minister Namalyu. Under the terms of the ceasefire, the security forces are pulling out, pulling out completely. That includes the regular police, as well as the troops and riot squads. Some of these men had been based in Bougainville for years. They and their police dogs are now gone, leaving the province without a recognised law enforcement agency. Here at the Kieta police station, the writing is on the wall. Throughout Bougainville, court cases have been adjourned indefinitely because there are no police prosecutors and prisoners have been let out of the cells. 
In the absence of lawful authority, the Bougainville Revolutionary Army is attempting to set up its own BRA police force. Up until just over a week ago, these men were being hunted in the jungle. Now they're trying to secure facilities such as fuel stations, and they're even checking on their former pursuers. There have been robberies of food, clothes and vehicles, but the red bandana is to be seen outside shops, the symbol of the rebel leadership's effort to maintain order. The BRA's main problem now seems to be one of discipline, keeping control over those who've been described as opportunistic criminals. The total withdrawal of all central government authority has ended the war, but it leaves the uneasy question of what follows now. The road up to the Bougainville copper mine is no longer guarded by Papua New Guinea government troops. The Bougainville Revolutionary Army, the BRA, now has its own roadblocks, manned by some who look as though they should be still at school. The final roadblock is at the boom gate to the Bougainville copper mining lease itself at the top of the mountain. These men now govern the area they terrorised for more than a year. The BRA assures me they are keeping the mine intact, that they don't want to destroy the asset. The exception is the Panguna police station, symbol of national government authority and the home of the enemy, which was burnt down the day the militants took over the town. Panguna appears a ghost town, although as soon as the first strangers appear, the men, who had been 15 months fighting in the jungle, come out to investigate. The militants who eluded capture and ran an extraordinarily effective guerrilla war appear well fed and hardened by the experience. They now number several thousand. The majority shareholders in the Bougainville mine, CRA and the Papua New Guinea government have no presence at all left up here at Panguna. It's not CRA, but the BRA that's in control here. Relations between the departing soldiers and the men they've been fighting are remarkably amicable. Prior to the ceasefire, well over 100 people were killed, including 28 government security force members. But these men, who two weeks ago were killing each other, seem to be very glad the bloodletting is over. Members of an international delegation of ceasefire observers led by Ambassador Deborah from Ghana received a shock when they arrived on Bougainville. The police that the national government had assured them would be there were nowhere to be seen and the last of the soldiers were leaving, some on the jet the diplomats had flown in on. The soldier in charge of the emergency operation, Colonel Leo Nuya, went too. According to the official program, he was supposed to brief the observers, but he left, never having approved the official engagement. The diplomats were left in the care and protection of these men from the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. The soldiers started packing up almost from the day the ceasefire began. One of the last acts was to remove the final sign of Papua New Guinea National Government Authority. The soldiers, riot police, normal duty police and prison warders were all off Bougainville four days before the date the National Government and the BRA had agreed on, throwing the whole observer mission into some confusion. The BRA physically is in undisputed control of the streets and many of them are convinced that the days of the Republic of Mekamui have begun. The military commander of the Bougainville Revolutionary Army, Sam Kaona, told me Australia was responsible for financing a war against the Bougainville people, including the donation of Iroquois helicopters. When the security forces of Papua New Guinea, when they killed our innocent civilian people, they used those helicopters to dump them in the you know, out in the open, open sea or ocean. That's one of the contributions to Australia did. Senator Evans today rejected Kaona's claim. But it has to be understood that there is no suggestion in any of this that Australia had anything to do with any such act if it did occur, uh, that Australian military personnel were in any way involved. It's just a matter of, of the helicopter being used possibly as a transport vehicle. All Australian donated hardware to the PNGDF, including three patrol boats, have now left Bougainville waters. Tempers flared in the Papua New Guinea Parliament today with opposition members claiming the Prime Minister had himself to blame for Wednesday night's abortive takeover of the government by a disgruntled and drunk police commissioner. The botched coup came after a function welcoming troops and police home from Bougainville and the opposition alleged that Mr Numanyu had mishandled the ceasefire, leaving the island to the rebels 
and the security forces shamed with the tag of defeat. However, the Prime Minister says the threat of a takeover has passed and the police have given him a pledge. Total and undivided unswerving loyalty to the government of the day. Mr Hawke says he's spoken to Mr Namalyu by telephone. I took the opportunity, of course, of ensuring him of the Australian government's complete commitment to constitutional processes in Papua New Guinea. The ceasefire on Bougainville ends with nightfall tonight as far as the Bougainville Republican Army is concerned and Air New Guinea has been flying plane loads of non-Bougainvillians out all week. One Australian married to a Bougainvillian has decided enough is enough. You're unsure what's going to happen to your family and yourself, your business, so you've got to step up and go and try and start a new life. Bougainville is now controlled by Sam Kaona's Revolutionary Army.